Well, hello there, YouTube. Welcome to the continuation of this self-portrait painting live on YouTube. So um, I'm going to begin this video once again by reiterating the importance of painting from life, or uh, let's just say painting from nature. In fact, painting from nature and painting from life uh, can both mean the same thing. So in the title of the video, of course, I wrote um, painting from nature. But again, painting from life means the exact same thing when you are painting something that's uh, in front of you. Or in this case, I'm looking at a mirror, which you can't see, of course, in this video because the mirror is all the way uh, away. So um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on this painting and I'm going to discuss some important information and some important concepts involved in painting. And that's what we're going to do. So let's just go ahead and get right to it. I'm going to start mixing up a shadow color. So I'm not going to oil out the entire painting. Uh, I am going to just go and work wet into dry. And this is pretty much just the first layer anyway. So you don't want to use too much, um, too much oil or anything like that just, in, just yet. So if you're curious about what colors I'm using, please see the description box of this video. And I will uh, constantly talk about um, the importance of painting from nature. And I'm going to relate that to uh, pretty much every step of this process as much as I can. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing up a... Um, the shadow color that I'm seeing is kind of like a dark brown. It's a dark greenish brown. Um, it's important to not limit yourself too much when it comes to color. As you can see, I have a bunch of different colors on here. And uh, even though there's a lot of colors, it doesn't mean that the whole thing is going to be overly saturated or anything like that. Um, it, it's just there to give me the opportunity to paint any situation. So when you're painting from nature, you're going to see so many more color uh, combinations or so, so, many, so much more color is, is going to be apparent when you're painting from from nature and uh, it's just not information that's available to you if you're only working strictly from uh, the photo reference so uh, my first little mark there it seems to be a little too warm so I'm going with kind of a weak blue and this is a uh, cerulean blue and I've added a tiny bit of cadmium yellow pale so now it's going to go really greenish. So you can see it's still a nice little neutral brown. And this is the color that I'm going for. Somewhat the color that I'm going for. So what I'm doing is I'm using a more broad uh, color spectrum here with this painting. And uh, the idea for this first little... Um, few brush marks here is to just sure up some shapes for the darks. So the um, I'm pretty much just getting acclimated to the painting again. It's been a whole week since the last time I worked on this. So if you missed the first one, uh, please check out the, the first video. On, and it was um, around the same time last week that I streamed it. So I'm shoring up the light and shadow delineations with the shadow color. And I, I usually try to emphasize that the most important thing is the fundamentals, not so much a uh, how-to. You don't want to paint by checklist. You don't want to paint by numbers. You want to paint by feel. You want to be able to just react when you're painting. And my nose does not look like this. And another thing to uh, mention about self-portraits, and one of the reasons why I think many people don't do them, um, is that you, you're thinking of it as yourself. So sometimes I'll say my nose, but in reality I should just be saying the model's nose. Remember, for a self-portrait, um, you are literally a free model that you can have for a, forever. I mean, there's no excuse 
to not paint from life. And I know that since pandemic and everything, things have changed. It's certainly more difficult for me to paint, um, you know, other live or uh, other models, of course. So, um, you know, it's it's nice to be able to do this, to have the ability to paint something that's there right in front of you, and not be overly reliant on the photo reference. But don't get me wrong. I mean, earlier today I was painting from a photo reference for another painting I'm working on. So. Not that I never work from photo reference, I obviously do. I just want to encourage positive habits, learning wise, when it comes to painting here. So, this is both a shadow color and just what I'm using to fix some drawing things. And my head is pretty square. Uh, see, there I go again. The model's head is pretty square, but maybe not that square. Tiny little drawing things. Now, the hardest part with the self portrait from a mirror is the basic block in, the basic shapes. So, we're still, even at this point, uh, restructuring those shapes right now. Not so much redrawing them, but going and trying to make light and shadow as clear as possible. For my light source, I'm just using a uh, LED light source. So it's um, kind of a, not a bright orangey, but it's somewhere in the middle. It's certainly not like daylight, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is a little triangle of light, um, also known as Rembrandt lighting, that I want to make sure to capture. So just using these lines to stir up the drawing. And uh, a little tip for you. So with oil paintings, you let them dry for a week, especially if you're working on an oil prime linen like this. Um, the, the paint will be absorbed into the surface, so um, it will be a little opaque or clear looking and uh, don't panic that's okay um, you can actually when you apply fresh paint on top it has this more oily quality to it you can actually see it pretty well there that's glaring um, and that you can actually use to your advantage so just use it to help you gauge where the new lines are resting even if it's the same value like this is probably the same value as that but it looks darker just because it's fresh paint okay so that that should be about good for cheering up those light and shadow shapes so now let's just go and get this color and add it to the shadow. Probably a little bit more green going through, so I'm going in with cadmium green. Another thing I should mention that's a little off topic, uh, but it's something worth mentioning is I've had some trouble 
with my internet today uh, so if I lose connection if we lose connection at some point I'm just gonna apologize in advance for that but uh, nothing I can do if that happens and no extra medium it's just the paint we'll use some medium eventually but not yet We're not quite there yet. Okay, so now let's mix up some of the dark. And I'm going to go with Daxazine Purple, Alizarin Crimson, or Alizarin Permanent, whichever you prefer. Viridian. Now note that my palette is very prismatic. It, it's not, uh, say, like an old master type palette. Let's see, it's ultramarine blue. But these are the colors that the old masters probably wish that they had. Um, much stronger, bolder colors. I do have some antique colors in here, like lead white, lead tin yellow, chrome yellow. Again, please see the description box if you're curious about what colors I'm using. And I don't have black on my palette. Um, I try to mix up my own dark. As you see, this is my own little creation. So I don't have any of the umbers either. I believe I drew this with just burnt sienna and ultramarine blue last time. So this is going to be a very important transition here. So from the shadow to the dark of the hair, which of course is going to have some more yellow in it because you know that yellow is the complement of purple. So if it becomes too purple and you want to go brown, add yellow. Now my hair is of course a dark brown or should I say the model's hair uh, is a dark brown. Okay, so there is some facial hair the model has. Right over here. Then a little goofy at first. We're just roughing in the shapes. And the accent for the nostrils. Using a little more alizarin for that. Alizarin, doxazine, purple. Mixed with what I already had. Now these darks will sink in next week when this dries. So it may look really dark now, but it will not be that dark looking next time. So I have to decide. I'm talking while I'm looking at the, the mirror. So I don't want my mouth to be open while I'm painting. So I'm going to be quiet for a second.
All right, so I was just trying to get the line for the accent there. I'm going in with perylene red, cadmium green. That's probably a bit too dark, so it'll be fine for now. A little white. So I'm actually using lead white number two, Rublev lead white number two, um, which is the walnut oil lead white. And I'm, the only reason I'm, I'm using the walnut is because um, I'm planning on only working on this painting once a week. As I have other painting projects I'm working on, and of course the projects for my online students. So I'm not too worried about this drying very quickly. Uh, a little more information about that. Um, lead white number two, uh, also known as, sometimes known as Kermanence white. Uh, lead white with Walnut oil is the main vehicle, it tends to dry a little more slowly. But it has a different uh, handling property than uh, lead white with linseed oil. In that it's a little more silky, I think it feels. More stringy than the linseed oil, lead white. Another thing to mention um, is that this video is being filmed with a camera at an angle. So just bear in mind, it's a fairly large canvas, 20 inches by 20 inches. So there is definitely going to be an, uh, uh, some distortion. The more realistic the head will become, the more apparent the distortion becomes. So. And speaking of distortion, I always have to uh, mention this. The palette is a wooden color. It's a middle tone brown. The painting is not middle tone brown. So the colors mixed here will look different than the colors that you see here. So just bear in mind. Okay, so going back to the shadows now. See a little bit more green. And when you're painting from nature, which is the main topic here, when you're painting something that you see as opposed to something that the camera saw, you're going to see a lot more color, especially if you train using an extended color doing color studies, as I have recently introduced to my online students. There are so many color variations in nature. Kind of impossible to try to capture that with a limited palette. You can. Obviously a Zorn palette is going to make things look very naturalistic. But uh, there's always going to be another level of color that's not quite attainable with a limited palette. And that also depends on who you ask. You got some purists out there with limited palette that will say limited palette all the way. And it's important to use it and to learn it so that you can learn its limitations. You're not going to know the limitations of a limited palette if you never use it. A little bit of cobalt blue into the shadow tone to make a nice dark color, somewhat opaque. And that'll be for the for more facial hair. 
So the difference is, if you are using, say, a limited palette, you'd probably add black to make the dark for the facial hair. Which is fine. I mean, it'll look like facial hair. It'll be the right value. But, there's always a but. Um, it's not, it's going to lack color. What you're going to have is just monochromatic. So this, though it's not easy to see on the camera, is slightly bluish. So let's mix a little skin tone now. Go with something basic. A yellow ochre, burnt sienna. White. Cobalt blue. More burnt sienna. This is going to be a grayish. A grayish orangey. So I'm going to attempt to do these videos about an hour or so at a time. And remember, I made a playlist for these live painting videos. So if you check out the playlist, um, Oil Painting Live with uh, Upari, you will find a playlist for these videos. So notice that I'm sticking with the darks at the moment. Obviously this looks out of context in relation to all of this because I'm just kind of focusing on this little window. So let's go ahead and mix some more little color shapes here. So um, this is going to change from time to time depending on how I set up my chair and my camera, but there's a dark green. Maybe not that green. Add some burnt sienna to brown that green out a little bit. Okay, so here it's just dark. And then we're going to paint in the color for the shirt. Now the delineation between those two values is so slight. Probably almost difficult to see with the camera. So there was a picture frame right here. I drew in those lines, but my chair is not in the same place. And I kind of like the picture frame a little off centered, like to the edge there. When you're painting from, from nature, things are going to change, uh, especially if you're working on a self-portrait and sometimes you're in a different spot. So be open to that change. Uh, it might not have been a good idea to put that green right there as I usually rest my pinky there, but oh well, be open to change. Okay, so next is the dark color for that collar. As I squint down, it is dark, uh, but it's probably not uh, as dark as this. So I really have to squint. So remember, squint to see value, blur your eyes to see color.
And it gets even darker towards the neck. Another thing I should emphasize is the materials. So use good quality bristle brushes. Uh, it doesn't matter what brand you use, you can use whatever brand you like, but I I tend to like silver brush. I've been using silver brush. Remember, I'm not sponsored by them, so I, I don't care what brand you use. Another good one is Sim, uh, Robert Simmons. And that's enough for that color. Over here, very important to get these dark shapes out of the way. So, a lot of emphasis goes into the hair. And always try to paint uh, adjacent, adjacent shapes next to adjacent shapes. So, now I'm going to go into that shadow tone. Yellow ochre, okay. mix it into whatever pile on the palette feels right. Just gonna use the dark color for the hair, the eyebrows. Now whatever you do, don't paint the eyebrows as just a, a basic line. In fact, I, I tend to paint the eyebrows in and paint them out a lot. So I paint them in and then I paint them out so that they don't look like they're painted on. And you see how I have a bunch of brushes that I'm using now. So a brush for the darker darks, a brush for the lighter lights, a brush for the background. And these colors that are, are, are just split second decisions. Split second decisions. You don't want to mix by formula. And spend as much time as you can just observing. Paint as accurately as you can. Paint exactly what you see, but with much less detail. Now when you're painting from a photo reference, that's different. You don't want to paint exactly what you see from the photo reference. You want to um, edit things that look photographic and replace those things with things that look natural. But how would you know what would look natural if you don't paint from life? So that's another huge reason to paint from life. I can't believe it, but in the past, modeling for portraiture and figure painting, of course, used to be a profession, and it still is today, obviously, um, just like portrait painting is still a profession today, but, but very rare. Uh, so it's, it's actually very hard to find a model 
that poses for you, obviously you have to pay them. Uh, that is an exceptionally good model. It's actually very difficult. So that's another reason to paint yourself. When you're painting a self-portrait, you know that that model is going to show up on time. That model is going to be there. That model is going to be reliable. Obviously, that model is going to move a lot, but as long as you remember how to reposition yourself, and it's a it's a quick thing. I mean, you'll memorize the pose after like the first I don't know, like twenty minutes or so. Speaking of pose, remember I'm looking slightly up. So I say the model is looking slightly up. So I'm seeing some more of this top plane up here. And the glasses. Just like the eyebrows, you paint them in there and um, you accept that you end up painting over that. From time to time. So whenever there is a broad area in one of my paintings, that is um, any broad area, like excluding a face, because a face is more, um, there's a lot of stuff going on here, obviously, right? Um, but in a, in a painting where, say it's like this big mass of hair, I'm actually gonna go and just cover the whole thing with dark and here's where some medium is going to go into play so first I'm going to have to mix up this dark I got to think about it um, I want it to be warm a warm brown that leans towards orange so I'm using my colors a bunch of them I mean like a, a bunch of them until I get something that I like and then I'm going to add medium to it Neo McGilp is the medium that I'm using, a uh, medium made by a Gamblin, and um, Neil McGilp is on the far right side of my palette. So if you follow my hand here, it's all the way on the right side. Neil McGilp is a, um, a medium speed dryer. It's not like a super fast dryer. I have to move the hair behind my ear so I can see my ear. And I only have, I'm only showing part of my earlobe, of the model's earlobe. So I like to go in with a big and broad shape. Obviously, I could be using a larger brush than this, but I'm trying to paint with as much precision as I can. I'm kind of lazy to look for a larger brush. Like I said, my hair is longer since the last time you've seen me on camera. Most of my loved ones hate it, but like I said, it's my hair, it's my life, so I wanted to grow my hair out. So the idea is cover the whole thing with dark, and then go into it with light. But as you see, even with this dark, I'm going and I'm guesstimating individual planes. I'm not just indiscriminately going all over the place with this dark color. I'm, I'm putting this in like there's actual individual uh, different strands and different planes.
So my, uh, the, the model's hair is somewhat curly but very wavy. The best description of this hair is it's, it's, a, it's a big ball of, of stuff. It's just a lot of stuff, a lot of volume, I guess. And it's very fun to paint. Because there's so much structure to it. So you see, I only used a small amount of medium, and even then, a small amount of paint. And the brush strokes are doing a lot of the work for me. Okay, so now we have to go and add some more information around the hair. So first I'm going to start off up above so it is a darker, it's actually even darker up here than what I'm seeing for the hair. Darker yet greenish. So I'm going to go with phthalo turquoise and Indian yellow. This is going to be very dark and um, hopefully very green, but not in too intense of a green. And that kind of works, though so you can't see it. I'm going to zoom you out. But like I said, in this, in this painting, there's going to be a lot of stuff in it. There's going to be a chair. There's going to be a canvas, a uh, picture frame, so the head is just a head. In other paintings that I would do, uh, where it's just head and shoulders, the head takes up most of the uh, emphasis, right? But not the case here. There's a bunch of other stuff. So for the background, I like to use the uh, Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. So that's what I'm using for this. A little more ultramarine blue. And oxygen purple. Some more medium. Change up the color a little bit. So the picture frame has moved relative to me. So the picture frame is actually a little off to the side, like conveniently right over here. So here's where I'm going to thin out the paint and cover very quickly. So it's just a little bit of Gamsol. The more thinner you use, the more the paint is going to sink in um, when it dries. So just be uh, prepared for that. Not a bad thing, just one of the properties of oil paint. And when you're painting from nature, this is one of the best uh, times to paint environments because you have the perspective without distortion. With the photo reference, there's always distortion and you have to work around it, which is not impossible. I do it all the time. People do it all the time. It's just nice when you don't have to do that. Now, admittingly, I have raised the frame a, a little bit here because the frame actually meets perfectly with the chair. 
uh, in the mirror, and I don't like that. I don't like when things meet up perfectly. So I'm editing that. Now you can't see some of what I'm going to fill in, so I'm going to take the webcam out. So I'm just going to take the webcam out whenever I need to. Okay, so now I can bring the webcam back. And you can see uh, there is definitely room for some areas in the hair to go darker. So you can mix a really nice dark uh, colors with uh, Thalo Turquoise. So I'm using Thalo Turquoise and Alizarin Crimson. Of course you could use Alizarin Permanent, whichever you want. See how much darker that goes. Now obviously you can't because of the camera. So I can adjust it a little bit for you. So there it is. Now it's really bright. So you can see, hopefully, how much darker this can go. So Thalo Turquoise and Alizarin Crimson. And what's nice about that is extremely dark, but when you look at it, say like outside, uh, you'll actually see the tail of turquoise uh, shining almost. Whereas in an old master painting, you really can't, you, you won't see that. A dark is just a dark. It's going to be, it's not going to shine, so to speak. They're also hundreds of years old, so there's that. But with modern colors, you can get so much luminescence you just would not be able to get any other way. It takes a while to learn how to use these colors in a way that isn't frightening, but it's a worthwhile endeavor. Like I said, uh, spend as much time with the hair and the stuff around the hair as you do with the face. Don't just hyper focus on the face unless it's just a head and shoulders study, then, then that doesn't matter. So I'm adding the brush strokes in this direction uh, only to reduce glare. You can see how dark that color gets. Again, another advantage to extending color palette. And I, I, it almost looks like I don't have to it almost feels like I don't have to add too many extra lights for the hair. So I'm only, I'm gonna just very sparingly add them. And yes, the canvas is moving around because it's not, uh, there's a little trouble with my easel. Okay, so let's use the skin tone, maybe with a tad bit more green. Let's use it to add some of these lights. So you see that the hair has middle tone, 
it has planes, it has color changes, all of the ingredients that the face has. And the hairline is one of the most important edges to uh, differentiate, so we're going to get to that um, at the same time that we're putting in the highlights. So the hairline is one of the softest edges in a, in a portrait. It's also one of the most careful edges. So you can't just go add a couple brush strokes and hope for the best. You have to plan it out. Like I said, there's no excuses to not painting from life. You will always have yourself to look at in the mirror. Don't let other people tell you otherwise. Don't let other people discourage you based on how you look uh, or any of that stuff because it is not relevant to painting. Now I can go on one of those little crusades and say that we're all beautiful and stuff, and, and it's true. There's beauty everywhere in the world, but you don't want to think about that while you're painting a portrait. You want to think of it as a series of shapes, which is how you always want to think about painting. Do not get distracted by the aesthetics. But let me again um, say that to, to you, the viewer, that you can paint yourself, no matter at what stage in life you may be, beautifully and still be true to what you are painting. If you paint with a, a, a trained eye and with proper training, Beauty is something in everything, everything. Everything has beauty to it. And that's something that a camera just will never understand, is cameras don't see the way that we see. And I'm not telling you to make things up or whatever, it's, it's just the way it is. We humans see differently. Okay, so that should be about good for the hair. A lot more stuff that needs to get covered, such as the hairline. So we're going to go and mix up the skin tone. Again, just mix out of instinct. Forget about the formula or the formulas involved in creating the perfect skin tone because there's no such thing as React the paint and just be true to what you see. Now, quite simply, when things go a little strange, like the skin color there started to get a little too warm, contrast it with green, so cadmium green.
Like I said, paint exactly what you see, but with less detail. It sounds difficult, but it is, I think, one of the best oversimplifications I can make on the art of painting. Paint exactly what you see, just with less detail. And when I say less detail, I mean a lot less detail. Okay, so the chair definitely needs some, some attention. So first what I'm going to do is just cover this last bit of, um, of the uh, background that I didn't capture. Of course, I'm going to thin out the paint. A little bit of camsole. And this is actually the edge of the of my canvas in the mirror. So now the chair, um, really quickly. It's got some light reflected on it from my TV. I don't know if I want to paint it, but um, I'm just gonna go and mix something similar to what I see, and then decide that later. I do want to paint that reflection. But like I said, one of the nicest things about painting from life is the change. Because you get more options as things change. So I have to squint down to look at this value, and I think it is a little light. Now it is lighter than the hair, and there's a reflection coming in from the TV, so there's that. And like I said, when there's a broad space, when there's a big space, like I did with the hair, thin out the paint, cover the entire thing with dark, and then work into it. One of the most efficient ways that I've found to paint stuff in and um, stuff that's in paintings, like uh, stuff that's in compositions. Meaning, obviously, the face is the main focal point, and you actually can see a painting in the background where you can see a face, and then there's stuff like background. So when there's stuff like that to paint in cover with dark very quickly then go in and put in the uh, darker darks and the middle tones and all that now you, you can't see the bottom of the canvas because I've zoomed in so just uh, let's just focus on this for now focus on this chair Now I'm keeping the shape very vague. Next, uh, there are some dark shapes in here, which are shadows. Those are the most important things. I'm going to paint these in first.
So when you're painting from nature, again, exactly what you see with less detail. And what helps with that is to either blur your eyes or squint. Obviously, I'm not going to go into major detail with that, but I'm uh, putting in enough information so I can keep working with it. Now, there's a top plane to the chair. I'm just going to use some of the skin tone, a little bit of orange to it. Try to stay as true to the color that you're observing. And the best way to do that is to paint by relation, so relate the colors to one another. So this one is more green. And there's kind of a bluish reflection here. Paint that in. More blue over here. And that should be good enough to let dry and add more stuff to it next time. But that's a good little approximation for that. Next, a very important thing in this composition is the clothing. So I think I can get the webcam back. Yep. Uh, so here uh, there is. A lot of dark, so let's go with Paraline Red with the dark brush and just see what happens. Seems to be working out pretty well. The regular old t shirt. Now it's red um, because of a, a Rembrandt self portrait that I saw where he had a oversized brown shirt along with uh, a, a red color so that's the only reason I would choose red because I tend to like to paint with uh, environments with more like neutrals so I'm going to move this a little more you can see what I'm doing. Now with drapery, it's a little tricky. So you want to pick your abstraction with the darks first. So there's a dark plane here, a dark plane here. And then under here, it's completely dark. Okay, well next let's just go right to cadmium red and just straight up cadmium red. So when this dries, I'm going to be able to go in and paint right on top of a pure red. So I'm using Old Holland cadmium red deep. Nice and strong color. You can see that the light is very thick, the shadow is very thin. This adds a nice dimensional quality to the paint. And every time I wiggle the brush around, like the way I've been wiggling the brush, it is to 
make sure that the paint is not very clumpy and to soften some edges here and there. And just for good measure, a little bit of alizarin into the shadow. Now I'm purposefully staying very still because I want to capture the drapery the way I see it at the moment. A little ultramarine to darken the alizarin. Okay, so next is this light shape. So now I can relax a little bit. I don't have to be in the same pose. And this has some light to it that is close to the skin tone, but different. Um, it's when I when I blur my eyes. Remember, blur your eyes to see color. And actually, what I'm doing is I'm I'm moving my glasses uh, down just to see like the blurred the blurred colors. Kind of a yellow greenish thing. And um, I'm just going to have to try a bunch of colors and something will work. So I'm squinting down and the value is not that light. So it's almost the same value as the skin tone. So that that seems to work. And next I'm gonna go and paint that color over here. In kind of a scratchy fashion. Gonna thin out the paint. So I thinned out the paint with Gamsol, not with medium, so it's a nice little wash, though be careful not to use too much. You don't want it to be like a um, consistency of a watercolor. So a, a common misconception is that People uh, seem to think that fat over lean uh, means thick over thin or uh, thin over thick or whatever. And the thickness of the paint actually has nothing to do with fat over lean. Um, fat over lean means the more layers you add, the more oil content you should add. And that is because traditionally, the oil that you use is linseed, which is a slow dryer, or walnut, which is also a slow dryer. So, in actuality, what it means is that you want your later layers to dry more slowly. You want your initial dryer, uh, dryers, initial layers to dry faster. So, by thinning out the paint with Gamsol and not linseed oil, I have ensured that this layer that I'm painting in now will dry at the um, desired speed. But again, I'm going to add way more stuff for the um, clothing and, and the face and, and whatnot later. Hopefully, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm hoping to be back uh, next next week on, at the same time on Tuesday. Don't quote me on this, but I'm going to do my best to be more consistent this year. Okay, so the canvas. 
The white of the canvas and the picture frame. Two things that I need to cover with the quickness. So again, I'm going to thin out the paint. With the Amsol. So I'm going to rely on the tone of the canvas for some of the highlights on this picture frame. Just for now, and I'll, I'll overpaint it later. There it is, so you can actually see what I'm painting. A little tough to get this camera just right. Okay, there we go. Okay, so next, I'm just mixing right on this. So the painting that is in the picture frame, ironically, is another self-portrait, um, but it's very dark. It looks very dark in the shadows, so um, I'm just going to first paint in a little dark shape for it first. And then let this dry, and then I'll paint into that. Now there are some other things that I would like to paint in the background right now, but I'm just going to leave it as it is. This is a perfectly fine little thing that I can paint onto. Now underneath of my arm, there's another little blank space. So actually underneath of there is uh, kind of a piece of wood, uh, which is a part of a cabinet. So I may kind of indicate it there. And that's subject to change. But it's kind of nice when you can hint at other areas of the environment with very minimal effort. Which actually gets me into another um, uh, idea, which is that this dark needs to change. So again, I'm just painting with very loose, a, a loose application of paint. Squinting down to see these values. Now the light there is some light right over here, a little triangle of light, almost like a little Rembrandt light for the clothing. And what's up here is going to be more or less abstract for now. Some little glimpses of light here. Like I said, paint exactly what you see, but with much less detail. And I do see a light there. So we're just painting it in there with very little detail. And here is actually a shadow on the edge of that collar. Here is another shadow. But the shadow shapes are not going to be exact. And that's going to be some more information for next time now what I'm gonna do is move the shoulder the shoulders actually a little lower right about there
And now we've got to cover the light for that, um, for the canvas. Remember, there's a painting in the painting. I'm just cleaning out the brush a little bit. And we're going to just use straight up lead white. There's already some paint on the brush, so I'm just going to let it mix. There's even some staples showing on the side of the canvas. So I may even get to paint those staples next time. I'm going to move the canvas over so you can see it. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know about lead white, uh, lead white is traditionally the white that was used by the old masters, uh, which already in and of itself is a great reason to use it, but also it um, it's not as blue as uh, regular, ti like titanium white, which is what most of you probably use. It, lead white is not as blue, and what you're noticing is it's also not as um, strong. So I can use a lot of lead white like this, thin it out, and it goes on beautifully. Whereas with titanium white, yeah, I can get the same effect with titanium white, but I'd have to mix a lot of stuff into the titanium white so it wouldn't be that strong. So there's a little shadow plane on the side of this canvas. I'll paint that in with the quickness. And that ought to be about good for the canvas. So I'm trying to cover as much as I can. So next time when I come back, I'll be able to tighten some things up. Uh, but this is the most important part at this point, is the, the big picture. And if you don't have a, a strong grasp on the big picture, it, it's going to make painting that much more difficult for you. Uh, a lot more difficult, should I say. Um, okay, so squinting down. Say that there's some stuff here. There's actually a Diet Coke over here. I don't know. I'll just make a mark. See if it has any significance later compositionally. This is how I think when I'm working on my own studio paintings. I uh, Sometimes I don't know if something will go well in one particular spot, and I'm just like, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to make a mark and... If I like the way that blob, that mark looks, then uh, I'll paint something in there. If I don't like it, then I'll just paint it out. And that simple. So, I think it should be good for today. Like I said, um, live painting session on a Tuesday night. Don't quote me on this, but I'm going to do my best to um, continue doing these. Um, and of course, I'll just keep working on this painting and uh, do the best that I can to you know, promote positive habits when it comes to painting. So uh, before I leave, I'm going to rotate the canvas so you can see it with less distortion, albeit uh, more glare but less distortion. I'm gonna get the webcam out of there. You can kind of see my mirror there, but uh, yeah, so that's what the painting looks like at the moment. There is a little distortion and um, my camera just went off 
line which tends to happen <laughs> from time to time but anyway there it is so a uh, little less distortion but as you can see by looking at the edge okay so there is some distortion my head is not that wide in the um, in the uh, original painting so next time when I return to this I'm going to keep refining the face probably still work around the portrait a little bit more uh, just refining some things here and there but this is one of the best ways, as I mentioned last week, to improve on your painting. One of the best ways to learn painting is to do exactly this. Paint your own self-portrait and work in such a way that you are observing, not so much copying. Observe. Paint what you see with much less detail and you'll find that this is a very enjoyable way to paint if you're only used to painting from photo references so um, having said all of that if you are interested in taking your painting education with me further please check out my online classes on uh, patreon.com slash artist i upload new lessons twice a week i also have a group zoom meeting with students once a week and for students in my one-on-one -on -one Zoom tutoring tier, we paint together on Zoom every week as well, uh, along with a uh, virtual classroom video, which is where I give my students advice on their artworks, which is also once a week, along with many other uh, benefits on my Patreon. So if you're interested about all that, please see the description box of this video. There is a link to my online classes a link to my patreon is in the description box of this video so that should be about everything thank you so much for watching i hope that um, these painting videos help you out i wish you the very best in all of your work also i wish you a very wonderful new year's as well and i will see you on the next one